islands being very young. And so, um, as I say, they're important scientifically, they're important culturally, and also really important landscape-wise. So, um, what happens, of course, um, just to give kind of a background, we're in the middle of the Pacific Plate that's under the ocean, it's moving to the northwest. Um, there's a lot of volcanic activity at the edges, like Philippines, Japan, and so forth. But we're in the middle because of this unique hot spot. Um, a place in the plate where my, uh, magna comes up and becomes um, building our islands and it's kind of a, a, long, a long stretch. So as you go from the new big island up to Kauai, we have increasingly aged and older islands. So we're all in sequence. There are actually two openings to the hot spot creating two rows of large mountain chains. We see the Waianae and the Kolau, for example, on this island. And, um, oops, going the wrong way. And so this is very recent geographically. What happens is these islands emerge from the ocean. They're hot, volcanic structures, and they're totally sterile. And this is kind of why it's an experiment, a scientific experiment. What's going to happen? We'll look at the timeline throughout geologic history. Um, Humans and flowering plants only came, you know, well, flowering plants started to dominate our, um, our, our Earth about uh, 30 million years ago. So many of the large plant families and many species already existed. Humans um, only really became widely dispersed in the last couple million years. So we have this this environment where everything is pretty much in place. In other words, we have, as the islands themselves are only Kauai, maybe five and a half million years old or whatever, you see that um, it's going to be um, present pretty much where it is now. I think the islands are moving, what, 10 centimeters a year. That's about two and a half inches or so. And it's moving very slowly. So even in, a, you know, in all these million years, that the islands existed, they haven't moved that far. So here they are, they're sterile, and the rest of the world is kind of in place. So what happens? Um, first, and also we're extremely, the most isolated island chain in the world, as you might know, these are some of the distances from other land masses. The only um, island chain closest to it, um, the Marquesan, are 2,000 and a half miles away. Um, there's one tiny island, Someone remind me what it is, about 800 miles away, it's about a square mile. Which one is that? What? Fanny Fan, what? Um, no, I'm thinking of another one. They just cleaned oh, off all the uh, plants, um, in, the invasive plants and animals there. They, they were, that's where they denitate um, or broke down all the... Um, Johnson. Johnson Island, yeah. So it's like one acre and it doesn't have great diversity of plants, you know, so it doesn't really fit into the formula. So here we have this setup where actually the closest land mass to our islands is San Francisco. <laughs> it's, it's two and a half thousand miles away. Always get a kick out of the air flights when they announce at the beginning, this is a nonstop flight as you leave Hawaii. And I'm thinking, uh, thank goodness. <laughs> I think I want to get to the West Coast. No stops, please. Um, so this is widely misunderstood in, um, in, recent, in past years, but I think more people are understanding it. We have unique divisions that are historically um, designated and scientifically designated by how we use the na terms native and non-native, which also can be introduced. Um, a native plant must come to an, uh, a landmass um, by non-human intervention, okay? It has to come through natural processes of wind, water, or animals. Um, and so in Hawaii, we have the highest level of endemic plants in the world, which uniquely are found here as natives and nowhere else in the world. Then we do have a small amount um, running about only 10% that's indigenous, which means like Naupaka Beach, uh, Naupaka is found in Pacific Islands and here. Um, so then introduced, and this is, these two terms are determined scientifically used the same way all over the world. Introduced, historically, we have Polynesians coming, 
they were introduced to species at island, <laughs> and um, they brought many of their plants, as we can trace across the Pacific, you know, the hala, the taro, and so forth. It's confusing because we talk about indigenous peoples, which is also used as a word for native, but specifically in our terms, we're talking about, well, humans, are they indigenous? I think we're all, um, you know, in, we're all from another part of the world, which would be um, Africa, isn't that the source of humans? So we've all dispersed ourselves and not, aren't actually native to Hawaii. But of course, you know, the Polynesians were first, and so that was a unique group of plants, only about 20 or so, 20 to 30. And then since Captain Cook and the influx of people from all over the world, then we had the recent introductions. So we start with um, 1778 with Captain Cook, so we have over 10,000 of these new plants, or even more. So here's indigenous plants, for example, Beach Morning Glory is indigenous. The little capsules can float in the water so it can disperse to other islands. Sandalwood, ohia, koa, so many of our forest trees are endemic, found nowhere else in the world as natives. Of course, a plant is native to somewhere in the world. All plants have a native home, right? But you have to determine that this is the tricky thing that most people don't understand. You have to say native to Hawaii, okay? In other words, native always has to designate a geographical region because, as I say, plants are native, all plants are native to some part of the world. And that reduces the confusion sometimes, native to Hawaii. We have some islands that are only native, or some plants are only native to Cayenne Point. There are two plants there that are found nowhere else in the world, and that's where they live. We have one palm on the Koalau, another one on the Waianae. That's the only place in the world they are native. So it can be a very small geographical area, though we can expand and say they're native to Hawaii, of course. Um, so here's many of the um, Polynesian introductions. At Leeward Community College, we have all of these major plants on campus. Um, we started gardens um, over 20 years ago, and we have um, we share um, some of the plants like ahuhu, which is a fish poison plant, or pia, which are relatively rare, but we grow them and share them with educational groups, conservation groups, <coughs> cultural groups, and you know, students and so forth. Um, we also have a shade house that grows many native plants, some for restoration projects that don't have that resource. This is from a grant from the Department of Agriculture, which has been going on for um, over like uh, 12 or 13 years, I kind of lose track, and I've been involved in that. We have the lar largest dryland plant collection, probably on this island. It's, um, we have over 130 dryland species. So we're right in the Leeward District where a lot of our housing is, a lot of um, gardens that you saw. And these plants can grow relatively well in the dry areas because that's where they're native. They used to live there for a long time. We have full-time horticulturists. We have a two-year program that's the same as CTARS, Hilo, and UH's first two years of ag school. You know, if you're going there, we're developing a landscape course. And we have ongoing courses about the native plants. And we have a full-time horticulturist take care of our gardens and shade house, which is unique to any campus. So we have very, very strong resources. Some of our trees are over 20 years old. Um, there are a lot of plants you won't see at that age um, in most gardens. So recent introductions, um, Dr. Lyon, for whom Lyon Arboretum was named, was proud that he had introduced 10,000, 10,000 recent plants, recent introductions. That's since Captain Cook's time. and. Um, we know that some have become very invasive. Um, they mentioned that website, you really should go to the weed assessment wedge uh, website because we really do want to avoid the things like replanting the um, strawberry guava, for example, which is really destroying our forests. And then Clyde, uh, Clydemia, Coster's Curse, those are really bad on our Waianae um, range, or no, on the Colau. And we just really have very degraded situation. For example, we have no place on our island, Oahu, that has a structured native dryland forest left. There is nothing left. Makua Valley in the back used to be that, but through all the use and misuse, um, it's very fragmented. 
you have to have hazmat training to go in and look at the plants. It's kind of sad. So here's a theory that came up early. I actually was a student of this professor uh, in California many years ago, and his, his work is amazing because he really showed us um, how most of our native plants came by birds. We have a bird flora. When you think about it, when a bird flies, and the, it's stuck on you know, goo that comes from the plant or mud on its feet or wings, um, it could be in the stomach, it's not going to carry avocado seed very well. <laughs> so everything it brings are very small, and most of those are actually non-trees. They're smaller plants. So what we have unique to um, our flora more than any other place maybe is that we have, you know, violets and sunflowers and things like that growing into trees. We have this amazing um, opening because here you have this sterile area. The birds are usually ocean going. You know, the little colea um, goes from Alaska to Hawaii every year. It goes for, for 36,000, 36, 000, 36 um, no, 36 hours of straight flight. 3,000 without stopping. It's just this little bundle of feathers, you know. It's not even that big. And we have other birds that make this migration. Well, they're mostly coastal birds or ocean-going birds, but they do go to different places. And for example, the cranberry that we use at Thanksgiving coming from the North America plant, we have the ohello berry, which is a close relative. And it doesn't take too much imagination to see how a bird eating that um, that berry, even though it's it, it will be kind of in coastal area or places accessible, and they bring it all the way to Hawaii. So we have basically a bird flora. Um, the um, very strong um, movement of jet stream also probably plays a role. We we have in Southeast Asia really the climate that more matches Hawaii, right? And so when there are violent storms, there could be an up updraft of material and it can be carried by the, the Gulf Stream. So the entomologist uh, Grizik, I think his name was, a number of years ago, maybe 20 or 30, people didn't think that was possible, but he was interested in small insects too. So he took an airplane up into the jet stream with a little fine mesh bags on it and collected the air and he brought it down and yes, he did find fern spores and tiny insects. And ohia seed, if you've never seen it, it looks like a piece of sawdust. I mean, it is so tiny. It's amazing. So we know that some, some um, plants, though they're not a great number, could have come that way. We know the current patterns um, in the ocean, and it tends to be strong ones going north-south underneath our island. So it acts kind of like a barrier for water-carrying um, plants from below the equator and at the equator up to us. And so we have kind of less of those plants. We do have a number that a coolie coolie can break off and float. For example, the stems are brittle and very floatable. Pahoy hoy has a uh, little fruit that floats. Now Paca, you know, has those little uh, white berries that are very, um, very buoyant. So eventually currents can bring those. Um, Carl Chris did a lot of interesting work on how plant, how animals, well, how birds brought, brought um, different seeds and plant material. And so he broke it down externally, externally. I don't know if Aaron Purple is here, he's one of my students, but he wrote an essay. Either it's, it's checked on baggage or it's carry on. <laughs> Either it's in the animal, on the bird, or um, in, um, in its digestive tract. So we had many colorful berries. Very interesting evolutionary development is some plants here, like mints, that normally would have a non-berry but a dry <coughs> capsule fruit, actually overlay and form a berry on top of the capsule. And you can actually see the divisions. See, berry normally doesn't have divisions to it. It's just a, like a grape, just a single round fruit. And underneath it is still the capsule. I mean, it shows that adaptation went to bird dispersal, That Birds, anytime you see a bright colored fruit, it's talking about animals being interested in eating it, and that's how plants, you know, get their seeds dispersed and move to different areas. So what's really interesting is what happened through this many million years of evolution, though that's relatively a short time for any kind of process to occur like that. But the original colonists, as we call them, the ones that came very early by bird dispersal and then some by water, and by wind, 
um, actually had to have certain characteristics. And I pulled this out of my reading. It's just my own list. But I was struck by the contrast of what was successful or likely that came originally, and then what happened later as, it, as the plants evolved to adapt to Hawaii's unique situation. Um, the first colonists had to be very weedy. That is, they were going to dump off, you know, in who knows where and what kind of soil and conditions. And so a very delicate little plant is not going to survive. They would have to have very small parts of them to get to the islands because we only have the birds. And the one exception would be, um, you know, by water. We know coconuts are very large. Actually, for a long time, we weren't even sure that coconuts are native, and that's still kind of up in the air because, again, we have a pattern of water movement that makes it a little difficult. Obviously, they had to establish themselves quickly, get that toho and going on um, very rapidly. And many of them were coming from continental areas where there are a lot of herbivores, bird, um, insects, grazing animals, all kinds of things so you know about thorns and prickles and poisons that protect them. Um, they had to have a bisexual flower. That is, the normal flower structure is bisexual, stamens, male, female, um, the pistil. And so they had to self-pollinate because the likelihood of a second plant coming at the same time, about zero. <laughs> so you have to be ready to go that way. Um, it had to have that dispersible characteristic, small, sticky, floatable. And originally, they'd be coastal adapted simply because the, the birds being a vector were going to bring them um, pretty much and drop them off in a coastal area. And eventually, we can actually see with some plants a whole series of species that move from the coast and adaptations occur. Camasyces is one genus that does that. And there's a whole series of, of plants, low shrubs at the coast and all the way into the forest trees. They're not huge trees, but you can see how the plants eventually spread their, their, um, their area they grew in and adapted to the different climatic conditions. Because as you might know, we have the largest number of, uh, we have all of, if they're about 13 uh, approximately, major plant zones in the world, that is like grasslands and coastal and temperate forests and tropical forests. We have 12. We have all but one of those on our islands and in the smallest space in the whole world. So you can go from Waikiki to the back of Manoa Valley. You've gone through four major plant zones of the world in about six or seven miles. There's no other place in the world where that happens. So what happens is the plants eventually adapt to these very narrow ranges, which is one of the reasons their uh, demise and their um, you know, tremendous uh, loss is happening because when you're adapted to the coastal area, you're probably not going to be able to move up to another area as well. So what happens is you don't have high um, plant competition. You may not realize that the plants really compete with each other. You know, that's why you pull out weeds from your garden so the weeds don't take the, the nutrients from your plants that you want to grow. And so their adaptations for being aggressive or being able to grow like a weed um, diminish quite a bit. They're more fragile, and that's one of the reasons they become easily displaced by then recent uh, introductions that come. Um, they actually go to larger fruits and seeds. Um, no longer dispersal is possible in a large scale. They're in a little tiny area, and so a large seed has the advantage now of getting a good start for the new plant, where a small seed um, you know, is no longer um, such an advantage. Um, we, we have almost all our native plants are perennial or lasting five or six years. One exception is Pua, the, um, or the Pua Kala, the prickly white poppy, um, which grows sort of a short time and is not really woody. But that sort of indicates to us it's probably 20, 30,000 years old on the island rather than being a million years. So slowly, because the prickly poppy does have thorns, we start seeing colonies that are less, thorn, less thorns on them. Again, what were the major herbivores on the islands? Well, these gigantic geese that we found their bones in the Ebba Plain. They're like huge turkeys walking around. And you can imagine what the Polynesians did when they came. You know, they were just like their turkey dinner walking around. And now they're all extinct. But they, were, um, they did feed on native plants. And some native plants, even in juvenile form, some of the native lobeloids, 
retain in the juvenile form thorns that drop off or prickles that drop off later. Um, so we start seeing the loss of protection because um, you do have a few animals and bird, um, animals and insects that feed on the plants, but begin, it's very difficult for those to be transmitted by natural means. So over, th over millions of years, the chemicals are dropped. It's to the plant's advantage not to have to produce those. Those take a lot of photosynthetic energy away from growth and to produce more seed. So if it's more advantageous not to produce these complex chemicals or structures, then the plant has an advantage to produce more offspring and survive. Then we see a lot of unisexual flowers and unisexual plants. That means um, one plant could have male and female flowers, which encourages a different kind of cross-pollination, but more significantly, male and female plants, like Achaea. Achaea has ma uh, male and female. So if you plant just the the male, it has all the wonderful fragrant flowers, but there are no berries, you don't see any fruit. And you have to have a female around, and then you will get cross-pollination. That helps when there are small populations of plants or animals, they need a lot of outcrossing. They, they survive better when they cross with genetically somewhat different members of their own species. Because, you know, look around, we're all different that way. And so that's why our children are different. And so it's the same with plants. I have to convince my students that every plant is genetically unique, just like they are, you know, in the classroom. And so you have a cross poly an outcrossing between different genetic types, which gives you the uh, basic genetic variety, which is essential for evolution. This is the way evolution occurs, is through uh, environmental pressures and genetic viability through diversity. What, what we see now in Hawaii is almost a total loss of the genetic diversity that we need for these plants to survive in the wild. Um, and they're just hammered by all kinds of other environmental impacts. So disperse, dispersibility gets reduced again, and then we see dryland forms slowly evolving into the forest. So our forest is a derivative forest. It's unlike any tropical forest in the world. It's full of, of um, plants, like there's a relative of the beet that forms a tree. Um, I could go on and on, but it's, it's really unusual. And actually, they produce different kinds of wood. The, the one plant, I'm trying to think of the name, maybe someone would know, but you cut a stem, and it's a woody stem, but when you cut it, it looks like rolls of brown paper inside. There are all these layers. It isn't like solid wood. Well, it belongs to the beet family, and beets, you know how they have the rings that you see in the root? It's the same thing. They're, it's just sort of reinvented wood um, in its own unique way. So we have just amazing things to show for that. So the most amazing kind of example I can give you of adaptive radiation, that is when one species or one type of plant eventually forms many different related species, but it's the foundering plant, is our silver sword. And when I came to Hawaii over 24 years ago, this, this study was just coming out and it was in the newspapers and of course in scientific journals and I thought, these botanists are crazy. That's, not impo that's impossible. They're talking about the silver sword coming, being, being part of a single um, off, you know, plant that got here over five million years ago, gave rise to three genera. So here are the genera Wilkesia, only found in Kauai, Debauchia, which is very many species on the Big Island, and silver sword, which we have silver sword in Haleakala, but also really rare ones on the Big Island, which are now being saved, thank goodness, by conservation groups. But from a single offspring, one plant getting its seed here, it gave rise to three genera and um, 28 or 30 or so species. It just, it's just mind-boggling. And you can't find that pattern in big, massive uh, continental areas. It's too... <laughs> too confusing to follow patterns. You can't see it with how ancient you know, those lands are and they've been remade and remade many times through um, plate tectonics. So everything eventually goes out in the ocean, comes up again and so forth. Everything gets wiped clean. So I thought the botanists were crazy. But if you look at it, and I've actually seen it, you go up to Haleakala, you'll see hybrid crosses between Silver Sword and Dabaudia. 
you, you can see that just with your eyes, they have the characteristics of both. And um, what happened is the botanist here and also my, <clears throat> my old teacher back in California who spurred this relationship and started showing it to people as a possibility. <clears throat> There's a, um, a plant called the tarweed in California. And just as the name in, implies, it has sticky, sticky stuff on it. So the little tarweed seed, which these are all members of the sunflower family, um, stuck onto a bird, got to, we think, Kauai, though I think there's some more updating on this, so I'm kind of giving the older version probably. But five million years ago, it, it came to Kauai, and it gave rise to this, what we call the Silver Sword Alliance. Well, how do you, how do you show that to people that that really happened? Well, there's one amazing way you can show it. They took existing species of tarweed and existing species of the Silver Sword Alliance, which would be the Baudias, the younger genera of the three, and they made a cross and they got a hybrid. And you can look at in um, some of the books have that art, you know, about um, Sumner and Gustafsson have a really nice little green book. You should look at it, the library about native plants. And they have a picture of that hybrid. Well, we know genetically you can't get across unless two things are closely related, right? They have to be like if you're crossing a, a donkey with a horse, you get a mule. You know, you have to have, or we have our, our wolfen, you know, at Sea Life Park. It's a porpoise and a related porpoise member. It's called a whale, but it's really in the porpoise family that cross, which is really rare in animals. But you can't dispute chromosomes. They know what they're doing. <laughs> they, they, can, they come together. So even after five million years of being separated, separated you can get a hybrid cross. So the cross will not, be, um, will not be viable. Is there someone in here that's going to do the next talk? <laughs> is, is there someone waiting here to do the next talk? Because I, I only had till 10, but um, I can finish this up. OK, just let me know if you're. <laughs> Um, so anyway, major plant zones, you need to be aware of those as you select plants for your different areas. And the major defining characteristics of the plant zones that you need to consider is what the temperatures are and the, um, the rainfall. And that pretty much follows elevation. So as you know, as you get higher, either on the windward or leeward side, it gets wetter, though obviously wetter on the leeward side and so forth. And so there's a really um, a wonderful map like this of Oahu where you see the rain, you see the um, patterns of rainfall like down here in the Leeward District we get about 20 inches a year and then that's an area that almost matches perfectly up to maybe 30 um, for our dryland forest and shrubland. We have the largest dryland shrubland forest range in the, in the islands, however it's the most destroyed. So. We used to have Iaea bush, which for which I think Iaea was named. We, we had all these wonderful trees and shrubs, and you can see many of these mature ones at our campus because we're in the dry zone. And it's, it, it used to be a, a Hawaiian woman told me at the Dryland con, um, Conference in, in Kona, she said it used to be in the spring full of all these you know, um, fragrances of different leaf textures and colors of plants, some like our dramatic, um, our tree hibiscus, which by the way is very easy to grow from seed, beautiful large red flowers like a big twisted hibiscus, beautiful green leaves, and yet we hardly ever see it in the landscape. Um, and their species, there were four species, Kauai's highly endangered, Oahu hasn't been seen for about 90 or 80 years, so it's probably extinct. I mean, how could this beautiful tree go extinct? It's beyond me. Then um, Kauai, yeah, Kauai, Big Island, and then the one from Molokai was saved by someone at the head of um, Waimea Falls Park many years ago. And to this, at Leeward, we actually have two or three growing, and there's some growing other places. But it came down to one individual plant on Molokai, and um, the botanist went over there and got a piece of it brought it back to the islands, grafted it on the root base of another tree hibiscus. And then for a long time, that was the only genetic plant we had in the whole world of that species for a long, long time. Then we found on the big islands, some people had saved a few. But that's how, how very 
low our, our numbers of plants are, it's really um, severe. Willy Willy is the most wonderful native tree. It should be planted in all our parks. Another one is Lona Mea, which is um, a, it's, it's a fantastic plant for dry onaries. It grows into a large tree. It's Sependus oauensis, um, which indicates endemic to our island. Um, it grows without any extra water. There's no insect diseases. It has green leaves and makes shade. We should have it instead of monkey pod, monkey pod, monkey pod. We should have lona mea, lona mea, and some other things. But we have hundreds of seeds in the ground at Leeward, just hundreds. Tricky to grow if you don't know how, but Bruce Cabley's book about growing native plants with um, uh, his other author, I can't think of right now. But that, that really does show you how to do it, and I know Rick and Matt are starting to grow it. Um, we just have plants that have tremendous potential. And Willy Willy is really fun to grow, and I try to grow different types. Of course, we had the really bad disease that impacted it, but they're coming back. And you can get the seeds in different colors. You get different color flowers, pink and green, red and yellow, the traditional red, orange. Um, really fun to grow. I mean, it's like a bean. You, you kids can grow it like just a green bean. You know, it just comes up and even though it goes leafless for part of the year, it's as part of its adaptation to the dryness, I think it's really a wonderful plant that we should be growing. Um, now we have things like koa haole, which is highly invasive. Um, we had really bad panini for quite a while, though fortunately I think a biological control has been introduced. So one tool that's been used successfully in recent years is biological controls, which are very carefully tested so that we're sure not to harm other plants that we want to keep and um, very successful because we would have lost our willy willy totally I think if it hadn't been for brave entomologists and botanists going into the homeland of Erythrina, that genus in, in, um, uh, in Africa in a really dangerous area. I mean, you talk about botanists or not wimps, all over <laughs> history they've been out in dangerous places in the world collecting plants and doing that because they have to go there. And that's really saved our Willy Willy from, I think, from extinction. Um, and actually another botanist for many years found a, um, something to, to, to destroy or to slow down the growth of strawberry guava. We were concerned, of course, we didn't want to ruin the crops of yellow guava, which is closely related. But now we do have that in place, and it's so highly invasive. And, and I think the cactus, panini, also there was introduced disease or pests that helps to control it a lot. But we keep getting more. Mesic forest, of course, as you move up the islands, it's a more open canopy of forest, and um, they're pretty much defined by elevation and rainfall. And then you get to the dominant um, trees of the mesic forest, start coming in the koa, ohia, sandalwood. I don't know if you can see my daughter in the middle of that koa tree. That's when she was in grade school. It's pretty dark, but she's sitting right in the middle. This is one on the strip, the strip road going between, um, oh, the gardens, what is it? Mm, oh, I know, from, from um, on Ma Mauna Loa, so you're going up to the, the road to the top of Mauna Loa and um, from the park, and this is a very ancient koa, and koas were so large that a, I read that a canoe was made of a single koa log that was 90 feet long and 10 feet deep. I mean, this is a massive tree, and if you follow the uh, Polynesian voyaging, their last, one of their last uh, va'a, canoes that they made, they looked for a large koa on the big island and could not find any that was sufficient. And that really triggered them to start a project which now has planted hundreds and hundreds of koas. Right now, we know there's two or three diseases and insects attacking koa. Um, we grew five koas at Leeward, only one is still existing. They die very fast because of these diseases. That means the forests are dying. Um, people are trying to research it. There are a couple, one researcher over at Hark Hawaiian Agriculture Research Station is throwing koa seeds into a, a, plot, a, a media tray and then introducing the disease, the fungus, one of the things that damages and kills it. And if anything survives, then he moves it on. So he's sort of speeding up natural selection. Another person actually can do, um, he can 
uh, with just a seedling, he can graft a native koa on the roots of the black acacia from, from Australia, which by the way is invasive, but not when you use it for a root base because it won't produce seed. And he gets a resistant plant, but that's a real technique that you have to learn. So we don't have a perfect solution, but we do have really tremendous challenges with all the introduced diseases and so forth. Um, historical periods, I just brought this from one of the books from um, Chuck, um, uh, Charles, I should have it up there. He, he, was, he was actually ornithologist on the, um, on the Big Island, but he wrote a wonderful book that explains a lot about the native plants and where they're found. So a lot of people say, oh, Hawaiians were just wonderful and protected the environment and blah, blah, blah. Of course they did, much better than we did, so we can't point fingers. But the reality is people all over the world, native people, cleared land with fire. They changed land to grow food. Of course, the Hawaiians had to be in balance, which were totally off balance, so they were able to sustainabil live sustainability but they destroyed huge forests. And we can find that in layers of, of soil types that are deposited. It's very clear with pollen changes. There's been studies on that. When I was in Australia, uh, New Zealand for sabbatic leave, they, um, they said they think the whole South Island, the beautiful mountainous island of New Zealand was almost totally burned over to flush out the moa, the big birds that are now extinct like ostriches, you know, kind of big walking birds, land birds, and they, they probably burned the whole island all over, you know, pretty much. So we know that people have an impact. We almost can't live in an area without an impact, but hopefully um, this will, um, you know, it certainly was better than what happened. Then when the whaling ships came, they harvested most of the sandalwood off. Most people think there's no sandalwood left on the island. Yes, I've seen it many places. We actually have two trees growing on a, on our, uh, in our forests now, in our gardens. They're very tricky to grow because the soil has been highly altered as things change over time. And so the microorganisms, the mycorrhizae and things that would help these plants survive often are not existing anymore. Then of course, since the great Mahele, we have this total change of ownership. We have the introduction of plantations and the high urbanization that really has happened. This is a forest that shortly, you know, not too long before this picture was taken, was a, a real, you know, forest, Hawaiian forest. It only takes a few years to introduce animals, like raising animals in there, to totally kill it off. And that's, that's what you see, what's left of the forest. Just the pressure of the, of the hooves of large animals will kill plants. I've seen koa trees that we, or um, ohia trees we've grown at leeward, when someone raked around them or people stepped around them too much, actually die within weeks. You know, you just, it's amazing. Um, I imagine some are more sensitive than others and maybe that wasn't the main reason, but it actually, I have to tell people, no, don't walk really close around the ohia trees because they're very sensitive to it. So out of our some thousand species, um, federally endangered, um, it's a larger number now, but you know how much money we get to protect endangered plants from the government? Anyone know? It costs, it costs about a million dollars to list them. You probably know. Zero! <laughs> nothing, nothing. That's why all these groups are so important, you know. And so what do we do? We have pig farmers, we have cattle ranches. I wish I could show you the picture. If you ever go to Maui on a certain weekend, or once a week in, on a month, you can join a group of volunteers that go up into a, a cloud forest. It has really rare native species, and they've been working there for over probably 12 or more years now. You can join them, and you can see um, a rancher gave them a big hunk of land. They put a fence around it, and they found out they could kill off the, um, the grass. What is the grass they use in all the, um, what? They found they could um, kill it um, with half the Roundup strength that you normally have. It's rather sensitive. It just dies in place, so now you have a mulch. And they replanted native plants, and they took out invasives. And have an aerial photograph, and you see this almost square, you know, rectangle where it's greener and pops out at you. 
from the air because that's what they did. So it just took, you know, fencing. In some places on Big Island, they fence it off. They call it explo explosions and just things pop out of the sea. Here on the Waianae Plain, when they left some land to follow for a while because they were deciding where to put UH West Oahu and so forth, all of a sudden up springs the red hy uh, hibiscus, the, um, uh, out, starts with A, <laughs> What? A butylon, thank you. A butylon, and it sprung out and had never been seen on Oahu for many, many, many years. And all of a sudden, we have an endangered plant, right, where we want to move things. I call it the revenge of the native plants. So um, they had to do all kinds of emaciations to, to do something different. Because, yes, when they're, when they're uh, protected by law as a federally endangered species, you can't just dig them up and throw them away. But how many people on private land decided, uh-oh, I have a native endangered plant. Out you go. <laughs> We have no idea because it's really a problem. Um, so we have a huge, huge, you know, many plants are not even listed. Sometimes people don't even want to list them because they actually get targeted for destruction by people that don't want to be changed by that. So in the past, we've had the two major federal parks, Haleakala and volcanoes, which have had a huge impact on saving things. Department of Land and Natural Resources in past years was terrible. <laughs> and even now, they support um, introduced birds uh, for gaming and so forth um, to, you know, as long, and also trying to save native plants and animals. And the two don't work. As you probably know, the pig, the wild pig, is one of our destructive animals in the forest. But also rodents. Rodents are throughout all our forests. They eat a lot of native seed. The pigs dig up soil um, that kills off, uh, they eat the uh, papu'u stem that has starch inside of it, that falls down, collects water. Mosquitoes develop avian malaria, so none of our native birds can survive below about the 2,000 level. And then you have erosion, if you've ever seen Waimea, Waimea Bay after heavy rain, all red, you know. The sugar cane fields bled all kinds of um, clay into the water. Um, I had a wonderful story a um, number of years ago, a, head of, a new head of, um, of Haleakala came and he was talking about <clears throat> how when he first came, he had an, an older Hawaiian man on his in, uh, employ, and he said, well, come with me and, and come to the, come to the, the uh, luau and the meeting of these pig hunters. And the, and the new introduction man, if I go to the pig hunter's place, you know, we're just not going to be, you know, compatible. This is going to be, no, no, you come, you come. So he comes and his, his, his employee shows all these pictures of beautiful native plants and all the pig hunters go, ah, ooh, you know, yes, we see them when we go out in the forest and everything. And then the man says, well, let's do a project. And they say, well, what can we do to save these plants? Well, instead of attacking him about the pigs, you know, he says, well, come up to the park and you can help us actually plant some and help us build up our collection. So the pig hunters come and they plant the plants and they come back and check on them periodically. Well, they come back after a number of months and oh my gosh, the plants are all broken up and stomped on and ruined. Pig hunters say, those blanking, blank pigs. <laughs> so, I mean, this is the way um, Maui has actually developed, uh, uh, in some projects, really good relationships with pig hunters. And what they do is they agree, well, this forest area is so degraded, forget about it. <laughs> this we want to save. Um, and then, you know, you work together with people um, to do conservation, just being antagonistic or my way or the highway, even though they're trying in the federal government right now. <laughs> you can see that doesn't work. Um, so anyway, we've been at Leeward, we're really involved in protecting and we, we grow a tremendous amount of native plant. We have seeds that are not available in any store. Um, we share all with, you know, people that are very, um, that can show a real commitment to be able to uh, grow these plants and, and share them with others. We have a huge native plant gardens throughout the campus, toward the far end of the campus, toward Waianae. Uh, Two hundred thirty species. We have thirty highly endangered plants in our gardens. Um, we have. You can go over to our table, kind of catty corner from the entrance for the exhibition hall. 
we have a whole lot of information about our our degree. We have a two-year degree that leads into a four-year degree in agriculture. We have um, certificate programs, so your workers or people that want to learn more about growing plants, and we're starting um, landscaping and native plant projects. My colleague David Eikhoff can really show you um, can show you how you know he's very very knowledgeable in native plants and this is our big project also supported by the grant if you didn't have a chance you can take four or five of these colorful cards with different native plants on it but it shows our native plant website that has extensive very very vetted very accurate information from recognize published sources. So you can go out on the web and get information that is not really very accurate about native plants, so you have to be careful. And um, so Dave is the go-to person for growing native plants. He has a native plant garden in his place in Pearl City. He can just grow about anything and he can give you um, information. So I'm, um, this also, anyone growing native plants for to sell, um, you can get free onto our website. We're a little bit slow in getting everything up, so we actually have a whole lot of backlog because we lost our programmer and so forth, but we're moving ahead, and we want to link growers with the plants so that you, if you want a white hibiscus, you can click on the part that says nursery and go. We have hundreds and hundreds of pictures. You may not realize, but in the photo gallery, we have one of the best collections of native plant pictures, so you can see close-ups and different forms and different colors and you know so you really get a full picture and they're very we vet them very carefully so that they're very good photographs that are you know useful that way so any questions that you can 